Hello, good morning. Thank you for attending for this uh, webinar today. Today I'm gonna talk about IOL calculations and I put the title IOL calculations on the 21st century because we've come a long time since the first uh, IOL implantations that, that we made. So let's talk a little bit about history. The first intraocular lens had been used in 1949. Ridley actually placed the first intraocular lens in that year. This is actually an electron micro photograph of uh, IO, the IOL that Ridley used the, on that time. So to calculate the IOL power, measurements of the actual length, actual length, keratometry, the curvature of the cornea, anterior chamber depth, Length thickness here and white to white are necessary for uh, the correct biometry on calculation of the IOL. Achievement of a target refractive outcome has become an integral part of the cataract surgery. So, with the advent of optical biometry and introduction of new IOL calculation formulas. It has improved a lot our ability to accurately predict cataract surgery refractive outcomes. We, we've been using ultrasound for a long time to, to do our biometries. Now we're using other sorts of technologies, such as low coherence based interferometry uh, that is much more accurate than ultrasound and less uh, dependent on the operator. Also, on the last years, Swepsor's OCT is used to obtain even more precise measurements. We need accurate measurements because we need to minimize IOL calculation errors. In a review made by Dr. Uh, Ronald Meles uh, of more than 260,000 eyes, it was found that less, that less of 1% of cataract surgeons obtain plus minus 0.5 diopter accuracy of 92% or better. But the great majority of the surgeons were clustered around the 78% level. If we're talking about uh, cataract surgery, it's not a recovery a surgery no more, but it is a refractive surgery obtaining less than a diopter in the calculation and the refraction after the surgery is considered a goal and it's kind of mandatory. If we review some of the formulas, we could see that less than 50% are be, uh, obtaining a refraction error of zero or 0.25. The vast majority obtained between 0.25 and 0.5, and then a lot of people also almost have diopter error. Actually, this is not good right now. So let's talk a little bit about optical biometers. Does the biometer really make a difference? So I started reviewing some studies that uh, we're making about this. Here's one that is a comparison of a new swept source optical coherence tomography, the biometer, plus some other base optical biometers. And the conclusions were that the repetibility and reproducibility of swept source optical biometer was excellent, and it agreed with the standard biometer, and the agreement was very high. So swept source and optical biometers perform almost the same in this study. A couple of years ago, in the ESCRS uh, held in Barcelona in 2015, I and a group of colleagues present a paper doing the same comparison, but uh, we doesn't have swept source OCTs uh, biometers on 2015. So we compare three biometers, optical biometers, IL Master, IL Master 500 and the Aladdin. And the conclusion was also that uh, those, these three biometers perform as well each other, except the IL master previous version. And this is because the previous IL master doesn't have the composite signal that IL master 500 has. And that comes to an interesting point. If the signals, I mean, the peaks that are get by the biometer 
are not quite good, then the biometry won't be quite good. And that's an issue when we come to heart cataracts. Here's another paper, more an actual one, comparison of three optical biometers, IL Master 500, Lensstar, and the Aladdin again. And there were no clinical significant difference between these three biometers when measuring actual length, mean keratometry, and ACD. So from these three papers, we could imply that the biometer doesn't make a difference. But does the biometer really make a difference? When we come, to heart cataracts like this one, and we start analyzing the curves that the biometer made, if we couldn't get a good retina signal because the cataract is so hard and the, and the signal won't came through, then we won't get any good signals of the retina. And the measurements the biometer made are all between all these peak signals. The first one, cornea signal, desmet, and the last one, retina, will take in account the actual length of the eye. So if you got uh, a mild or a moderate cataract, any bi biometer should do. When it comes to heart cataracts, you need some sort of uh, OCT, like sweat source that has a greater wavelength to get through these opacities and get a good signal. So this is, comes to our first question. Does the biometer really makes a difference? We have five options and you could vote right now. Yes, no, optical biometers are superior than uh, ultrasound biometers, A and B, or none of the above. Okay, we got the answers and the answer was yes. Yes, it does make a difference. And as we were talking about, it does make a difference only when you get heart cataracts. Now, let's be sincere. And I live in Peru. I, I am an anterior surgeon uh, based in Peru. And we here had heart cataracts. So when we had heart cataracts, we do need a biometer that could take in reliable measurements of these heart cataracts. As I told you before, and all the papers show, when you get moderate or mild cataracts, it doesn't make a difference. So let's talk about another important point, lens constants. The constants must be optimized if you use optical biometers. The A constant that is uh, the, the manufacturer gives you on the lens or in the, on the box that comes with the lens are the optical constant, I mean, are the A constants for ultrasound biometry. If you use that constant without optimizing in an optical biometer, you'll get a source of errors. Now, where and how do we optimize the constant, the, this constants? So there is a web page that's called ULIP. ULIP stands for the User Group for Laser Interference Biometry. This page was managed by Dr. Wolfgang Haggis until he passed away on 2019. This webpage is actually being uh, actualized with new constants with, uh, provided by several surgeons around all the globe, and you got the vast majority of IOLs constants optimized in this webpage. So this comes to our second question. How important are IOL constants optimization? They are very important. They are somehow important. They are not important at all. They are mandatory if you're using optical biometers or none of the above. I'll give you a couple of seconds for the audience to uh, answer the questions, and uh, I, I, I'll talk about the importance already about optimizing IOL constants. I, I will take a minute to talk also about Dr. Wolf and Haggis. He was uh, a professor and a good close friend, and uh, he was a great guy, and he, we depend a lot on, on his work about optimization of the constants. So uh, 
all all of the work that Wolf can do on the on the Yuli page still uh, good for us. So, how important are the IL constants optimization? Are very important. Yes, they are very important, seventy six percent, and are mandatory if you are using optical biometers. Both of them are correct. They are mandatory if you're using optical biometers. Please don't use a constant of the lens of the box if you are uh, using an Isle Master, an Aladdin, a Lens Star, or uh, any of these optical biometers. Now, let's talk about of mathematics and measurements. This is the formula that we mostly use for this. I'm just kidding. I'm not talking about mathematics right now. It's kind of hard. We're surgeons. We actually don't know that much about mathematics. If someone really knows this uh, mathematics equations and really like this, we could have another lecture about this on some other time. But it's, this is not the, pro the, the purpose of this lecture right now. According to Dr. Warren Hill, for actual lengths from 22.5 to 24 millimeters and central corneal powers ranging from 42 to 45 diopters and a normal anterior chamber depth, most modern IOL power calculation formulas will give good outcomes. Dr. Hill, if you don't know Warren, is the author of several formulas, including one of the most precise one, the Hill RBF formula. In this slide, you could see that if you got a normal eye with a normal anterior segment anatomy, all of these formulas perform quite well. The issue with classic formulas are when you got short eyes, where the Virgin's formulas doesn't perform that well, or when you get long eyes. If you also have in the anterior segment uh, some alterations, it will uh, give you some sort of errors in the calculation of IOL. Now we have these new formulas that we will talk about right now and see how they perform. Something to consider. As surgeons, we are being judged by our patients and our peers by our refractive outcomes. That's certainly true. It seems a little odd to spend thousands of dollars on the most accurate measurement technologies, but continue to rely on calculation methods that are not from this century. So optimal outcomes require the best possible measurement technology and the best possible calculation methods. So both things are important. One of the new, uh, Actually, it's not of the new uh, methods, but one of the, uh, how should I say this? One of the most important parameters to take in account is effective lens position. The effective lens position will, uh, has been described with the first generation formulas before 1980, where the effective lens, lens position was only a constant of four millimeters on every patient. And that's not true because the effective lens position has many, many uh, variables. How big is the eye? Is it a myop eye? Is it a hyperop eye? Does the anterior chamber depth is affected? Does the curvature of the cornea is affected? So second generation formulas in the eighties use actual length single bar bar variable predictor as a scaling factor for effective lens position, but they don't measure it actually. Third generation formulas use two variable predictors, uh, keratometry actual length and improved scaling accuracy of the effective lens position. But it's only with four generation formulas in the 90s in the 90s that Olsen and co-workers co improve effective, effective lens position accuracy, but by adding two more variables, ACD, that's the anterior chamber length, the depth and length thickness. So now if we wanna work and we wanna use four generation formulas, we need to know the ACD value and the length thickness value. They are important and mandatory for this 
four generation formulas. It's time for another question. So effective lens position is taken in account with which generation formulas? First generation, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, or all of the above? I'll give you again a couple of seconds for you to answer this question, but uh, we sure notice that uh, since biometers are not that much important when you doesn't have this hard rock cataracts, new biometers are important if you are wanna use four generation formulas. And four generation formulas are more precise than the other generation formulas and they work on all four of eyes. So the answer was all of the above, that's correct. And also four generation because four generation formulas are the only formulas that actually need a measurement of the ACD and the length thickness. So you could get the correct values to, uh, to get this formulas done. Let's talk a little bit now about new formulas. I wanna talk this uh, morning about five new formulas. The Kane formula, the Evo formula, the Hill RBF formula, the Barrett suit and the Olsen suit. This last two, I have the most experience. So I talk about this to the most, but let's review some of these interesting formulas also. Here is another interesting graph that will show you that between the normal eyes, all the formulas perform as good. The issue again is when you got these extreme eyes, big eyes or really small eyes. The Kane formula, here is the link if you wanna go and see the IOL uh, formula and how, how it performs. It's free and it's online. So you could get this formula for your calculations. This is a new formula and it's based on theoretical optics. It incorporates regression and artificial intelligence to further refine its predictions. A focus of the formula when it was first made was to reduce the error seen at extreme as extremes of the various ocular dimensions. We were talking a lot about this. All the formulas perform quite well in normal eyes with normal anterior chamber, with normal corneas. The issue is the extreme measurements. So this formula account this type of errors to uh, get a best performance on this. It used uh, actual length keratometry anterior chamber depth, and also patient gender along with optional variables of length thickness, central corneal thickness, and that predicts the refractive outcome a little bit uh, more precise than other formulas. Well, this formula maintains its accuracy at the extremes of actual lengths, resulting in a 25 reduction in absolute error in long eyes, long eyes, stands for 26 millimeters or more of actual length compared with SRKT formula. That's one of the most used formulas for big eyes. And also got a 25.5 reduction in absolute error in short eyes. That's less than 22 millimeters compared with Hopper Q. So if we're talking about these two formulas, SRKT and Hopper Q, we do know that SRKT performs pretty well for big eyes, that's why they compare it with this formula. And Hoffer Q is a formula that uh, performs the best with smaller eyes. So compared with these two formulas that performs quite well on the extremes, the Kane formula performs even better. There are more, multiple clinical studies that have been demonstrated that the Kane formula is more accurate than all currently available IOL formulas, including Hill, Barrett, Olsen, Hagis, Hoffer Q, Holiday 1, SRKT, Evo, and Holiday 2. So the use of artificial intelligence to for, further refine these predictions give this formula a great result. If you go online, this is what you will see, where you could put the surgeon data, the refractive index, the patient data ID, and then all the parameters that you need to get here.
axial length, keratometry, anterior chamber depth, length thickness, and central corneal thickness. This is one of the latest formulas, and this is the one that, uh, according to white papers, performs most uh, of the best. We talk another formula right now, the EVO 2.0 formula. Here's again the link. It's another free formula that you could go online and look for it. EVO stands for Emetropia Verifying Optical. It's a new thick lens formula that it's based on the theory of emetropization. It generates an emetropia factor for each eye. So it's custom made formula for each eye. It is stand on the factor that cornea growth is mainly complete at infancy and the majority of eye growth occurs in the posterior segment instead of the anterior segment. For a specific corneal power, there is an, a specific actual length and effective lens position to achieve emetropia. So here's another formula that takes in account effective lens position. So you will see that this is one of the most important factors that we are used in, in all modern formulas. The EVO 2.0 formula uses axial length, keratometry, anterior chamber depth, and also optional variables of length thickness and wide to wide distance. In a study published in ophthalmology last year, Dr. Mellers uh, and collaborators uh, used the EVO formula and they said that it was more accurate than the HEAL RBF 2.0 Right now we are on the heel RBF 3.0, and but sorry, but was less accurate than the Kane, the Olsen, and the Barrett formulas. So right now we see two formulas and several papers that says that the Evo 2.0 formula, the uh, Kane formula, the Olsen, and the Barrett are formulas that performs quite well. The performance of the EVO suffer in the short and long actual lengths of the eye, indicating that this emetropization concept may be break down at the extremes of the actual lengths. Again, we got the same issues. We got big eyes, we got small eyes, and the formulas does not perform quite well in this type of eyes. So the EVO 2.0 formula, even though it's one of the newest formulas, it performs quite good but not as good as other four generation formulas. If you go online, the IOL calculator for the uh, EVO 2.0 formula will ask you for the same parameters, actual length, Q1, K2, ACD, length thickness, central corneal thickness, and the target refraction. If you got patient with post-myopic LASIK or PRK, this formula will measure this if you get the data and the refractive history. So it will improve uh, the way it performs in post-surgical patients. Because let's be sincere again, we've been performing LASIK surgical or refractive corrections on patients for a long time. And the patients that we first start uh, operating were, uh, that doesn't were made with a laser, for example, a uh, radial keratotomy, now has a lot of irregularities in the cornea. So for these patients, the actual length will be the same, but the radial keratotomy or the LASIK surgery that we perform will induce changes in the anterior surface of the cornea. And that will be uh, that will induce errors on the calculation of the formula if we do not take in account this type of measurements. So we talk about that in a minute. It's other important factor. I, I, I look that there are some Q questions coming out on the chat. Uh, we'll have time uh, certainly at the end of this to to answer all your questions. So uh, let's talk about Dr. Hill and the Hill RBF 3.0 formula. This is where you could get this formula online and also it came with all these new biometers. The Hill RBF calculator 
is an advanced self-validating method for IOL power, power selection. It employs pattern recognition and a sophisticated form of data interpolation. This formula has been optimized for use with the LensStart uh, ILS 900 optical biometer in combination with the Alcon biconvex intraocular lens, that's the MA60MA, but it also works with data from other biometers with all the other biconvex IOL models. The, uh, Dr. Hill has a contract with the people from Lenstar and High Stride. That's why it includes this new formula and works with that biometer. As it, so, as it says, it will work with all the biometers as well. And you have the RBF calculator online. I want to take one minute to talk about uh, errors that we made when we uh, move data from uh, a biometer or, 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 or a keratometer to these online formulas. Sometimes when you get all the formulas on the biometer, for example, the Aladdin that's got the Olsen formula, got the Barrett formula and all the other uh, uh, third generation formulas, you will minimize the error of uh, making the data or, or changing the data from one machine to another. I mean, if you're performing ultrasound and then you have to write it down and you got a busy clinic, then you could, you could have some errors extrapolating the data from one machine to another. If you got all the data measuring on one device and all the formulas on that device, this will minimize this error. So the HEAL RBF 3.0, it's more accurate than the third generation formulas all the formulas we've, we've been talking about are more accurate than that. It indicates that it has improved compared with the original version. The original version is the 1.0, but nevertheless, it is still less accurate than the Kane, Olsen, Barrett, and the Evo formulas, which are all based on optic principles, suggesting that the artificial intelligence recreation model that Dr. Hill is using on this formula is not yet as accurate as the optical models. If you go online, the Dr. Hill uh, RBF formula will look like this. You have almost the same parameters to, to introduce and then you get the results. Let's talk about the Barrett suit. Here is the link for the Barrett suit. As I, as I told you, some of the biometers incorporate the Barrett suit. I work on a basic clinic here in Peru is a, a mainly the clinic that operates uh, most uh, cataract patients here in Lima. Uh, we perform around 60 to 80 cataract surgeries per week. So uh, we got a really busy clinic. And uh, since, the, since we have this Barrett suit formula, to be honest with you, this is the only formula that we are using because it performs quite well on every situation. We're talking about a suite because this is a combination of five different formulas for any type of eye or any type of situation that you could get on in, there is a solution on the Barrett suit. The first one is called Barrett Universal this is for non-toric IOL calculation with keratometry values. The second one is the Barrett toric. This is for toric IOL calculations. Then we got the Barrett True K. This is for non-toric IOL calculations in patients post laser vision correction. LASIK, LASIK, PRK, RK. If you got the keratometry values, all of them could get into this formula. The fourth one is the Barrett True K Tori. This is the same post up people of a, a laser vision correction, but got a Tori uh, refraction re reminder. Calculation with total keratometry values for this Tori calculation on post up. This is not the same here. This is virgin eyes, this is post up. And we also have the Barrett RX, RX are for uh, surprises that you got on the, on the OR. 
uh, if you if you want to exchange a lens because it's an older version of the lens or the patient got a refractive error, if you want to add a lens doing a piggyback, all these type of selections will be uh, taken account with the Barrett RX formula. According to Dr. Barrett, when using this true K formula after refractive surgery, he recommends entering the optional values pre-LASIK refraction and post-LASIK refraction if known, because then the formula will perform even better. This is the Barrett Universal 2. You'll see here are all the five formulas. Remember, Universal 2, non-toric IOL calculation with K values. This is the Barrett Toric calculation. Bar Barrett Toric is for toric IOL with keratometry values. You will see here that you even get a simulation of where to place the incisions. This is almost the same calculator that you got from the manufacturer of the toric IOL. So you will get the same information. Then we got the Barrett True K formula. Barrett True K is for post op of laser vision correction. Remember, here you got the correction type. You should uh, select which type of correction has your patient been uh, uh, performed. And you got the pre LASIK refraction and post LASIK refraction that it's important. They are not mandatory. Here is a uh, tick that you could mark with no history if you don't got the history of the patient. But if you do have it, it will, uh, the outcomes of the formula would be even better. Now we have the Barrett True K Toric. Barrett True K Toric is almost the same, but now we are looking for Toric lenses. So these are for patients, <coughs> I'm sorry, these are for patients that have been uh, performed a LASIK correction surgery, okay, but also had a Toric component, some astigmatism after this correction. And at last, we got the Barrett RX. Now the Barrett RX will ask you, I mean, the biometer will measure everything, actual length, ACD, length thickness, the refraction error, but you should need to know which model of IOL is implanted, which model with power, if it's a toric, the cylinder refraction, the pre-op keratometry, and then you could pick from a piggyback selection IOL or to exchange the IOL. So as you will see, the Barrett suit will uh, walk you through all these different situations that you could get from a post-op patient or from a bearding eye that it's performing a cataract surgery. The Barrett suit formula performs quite well over all types of eyes, short eyes, normal eyes, and long eyes. It performs as well as the Olson formula that we will talking, that we will be talking about in a minute. So this new generation formulas, Olson and Barrett, performs better than all generation formulas and even perform better than four generation formulas such as EVO and HIL RBF. That's why we are using these formulas the most. Now it's time for another question. Which of these are part of the Barrett suit? Universal 2, Universal 2 Toric, True K and True K Toric, Rx and all of the above. This formula, on my experience, is the formula that performs the best of all the formulas that we've been talking about on every situation. I want to assess that when we're talking about post-operative uh, corneas, all of the above, that's the correct answer. Remember that the Barrett suit include all these five formulas. And as we were talking about uh, effective lens position is one of the things that we needed the most to review. On post-op patients, the changes on the anterior surface of the eye will take in account for errors if we do not measure them correctly. Some of the biometers that we have right now work measuring only 
five or seven points on the central part of the cornea. And that works okay for most of the eyes that hasn't got a refractive surgery. Because as we've been talking, refractive surgery will change the anterior part of the eye. So if you take only six or seven points to measure the anterior surface, then you won't be measuring the whole cornea and you could get some errors or surprises after the surgery. So it's a good point to have included in your biometer also some sort of topographer. If it doesn't came in with the biometer, you have to do the measurements on a separate machine, a topographer, a pentacam, some sort of anterior chamber analyzer. But when the topographer comes with the, I mean, when the biometer comes with a topographer incorporated, a topographer, not a keratometer, a keratometer it will get you more information when you get these corneas that are already been uh, having another uh, surgery. Let's talk the Olsen suit. The Olsen suit, it's available on the ASCRS webpage. Also, some of the other formulas are uh, on the ASCRS page. You go to tools and then you could get all these formulas. The Olsen formula uses ray tracing and thick lens considerations to account for the true physical dimension of the eye optical system. It used the same technology employed by physicists to de design telescopes and camera lenses. One key feature of the Olsen formula is the accurate estimation of the IOL's physical position using a newly developed concept that's called the C constant. So right now we're talking of, of another constant. We have the A constant, that's the, uh, the manufacturer constant, but the Olsen formula also taking account this concept of the C constant. The C constant can be thought as a radio by which the empty capsular bag will encapsulate and fixate an IOL following in the bag implantation. So we all know that. The IOL after the surgery will contract, it will start to, the, to encapsulate and fixate the IOL. And doing this, if you got, for example, a big eye, it could move forward or backwards because you got a lot of room, a lot of space there to move. And that will affect the effective lens position. On an optical system, if you take a lens and you move it closer or far away from your target, you will change the refraction and you will change the uh, visual acuity of the patient. So this new formula taking in account this new concept of the C constant will provide one of the most exact positions and one of the best results after surgery. Here's a graph that compares the Olsen formula you'll see here on actual lens between 22 and 32. That's a really long eye. And you see that it's less than half a diopter compared with holiday, for example, that again, we know on extreme eyes will start having some troubles. So as input parameters, apart from the actual length and the key and the K measurements, Olsen used ACD and length measurement. Now we were we talk about five formulas, and most of them use these two parameters, ACD and length thickness measurements. A couple of years ago, be, before we were using this these new formulas, then thickness wasn't one of the uh, measurements that we consider because we were thinking we're gonna get rid of the lens. Why do we have to measure it? And the reason is that you're not getting rid of all the lens. You're just getting rid of the uh, central part of the lens, the cortex, the nucleus. You're getting the capsular back intact, or at least that's what you, you wanna do on a, on a fake surgery. So if you doesn't measure the lens thickness, you won't calculate correctly or estimate correctly the effective lens position. And we already know that it will give a lot of errors afterwards if we do not take in account this. So Dr. Hill 
Dr. Meyer, are currently assessing the performance of the Olsen formula in comparison with the Holiday 2 formula. The Holiday 2 is this one, okay? Uh, four generation multivariable IOL calculation method using length thickness measurements as a parameter for improved IOL prediction accuracy. In a clinical series of more than 1,700 eyes, Dr. Olsen assessed the performance of the Olsen formula as compared to standard formulas like Holiday and SRK. It's time for our last question. Which formula use ray tracing technology? Actually, this is a, a, an easy one. <laughs> we just talk about it. So, Hill RBF, Barrett, Olsen, Haggis, or none of the above. So, uh, a part of the uh, of the formula used in uh, ray tracing technology. Remember that this formula, in particular, uh, has a new concept. That's the C constant that takes in account the effective lens position uh, after the surgery, measuring two important parameters such as ACD and lens thickness. So the Olsen formula, perfect. Now, what, which formula should I use? According to Dr. Holliday's corneal power decision tree, that's one of the best decision trees I found about it. It takes in account a lot of, of, of uh, measurements that usually biometrists don't take in account. Keratometry, does the patient got dry eye? Is the treatment improved the refraction of the dry eye? Does the patient got a huge of astigmatism? Does it need a toric implantation? Does the topography on the 4.5 uh, millimeter central zone, uh, central zone is exact toric calculation or is the back surface of the cornea, for example, in patients with keratoconus, is, is, is uh, having any, any trouble on the calculations? After all these decisions pre making Dr. Holiday will talk about Holiday 2, that's his formula, Olsen or Barrett, that has a lot of variables. So, which formula should I use? Personally, I already talked about this. Uh, in the clinic, we use the Barrett formula for almost 98% of our cases. The other 2%, we use the Olsen formula. And in my opinion and in my experience, these are the two four generation formulas that performs the best right now. So in summary, achieving a target refractive outcome is an essential and complex aspect of cataract surgery. Accurate biometry is one of the most important steps in calculating the IOL power. IOL constants must be optimized. If you are using an optical biometry, never use the A constant that the uh, that comes in the box with the lens. You must go into the ULIP formula, I mean, the ULIP webpage and look for the optimized value of that IOL. Sometimes it's easier to ask the manufacturer which is the optimized constant for that lens. Usually they know, but sometimes if you don't ask, you won't get that answer. Now, we know the importance of having a healthy corneal surface. We talk a lot about this. Uh, dry eye, LASIK surgery, uh, anterior segment rings for keratoconus or even the keratoconus or high astigmatism, irregular astigmatism, will, uh, it, it is important uh, measurement that should be taken in account. Uh, four generation formulas or prior formulas doesn't take into account that much. Remember, they just need K1 and K2 values. K1 and K2 could be messed up if you got an, an aber uh, a cornea that has a lot of aberration. So it is important to have not only a good biometer, but also some type of topographer. And I will also say, if you're planning to implant uh, multifocal IOLs or trifocal IOLs that are dependent on the pupil, 
you not only need a good biometer and a good topographer, but you should also look for a good pupillometer. Right now, some of the biometers, such as the Aladdin, came in with the topographer and the pupillometer all in one machine. So it will minimize extrapolating the data from several machines to get the formula. Is another formula the solution? Well, it depends. We talk a lot about this, but you certainly don't want to be left behind in the race toward accuracy. We need the best formula and we need the best measurements for that. Of course, the formula you choose will depend in part of the equipment you are currently using. If you're using ultrasound biometry and, and you don't have a topography, uh, a topographer, uh, but you got a keratometer, you could use one of the third generation formulas. Uh, you couldn't measure ACT or you couldn't, uh, could not measure line thickness. Uh, so you couldn't use some of the, of the latest formulas. But if it's not a big eye, I mean, it's 23.5, 24 uh, millimeters, it will perform quite well. Remember, if it's a virgin eye, if that eye it's, it's, uh, has been performed a LASIK surgery prior to that, you will need four generation formulas, otherwise you'll be lost. So you also don't want to jump off a formula if it's working well in your practice. So evaluate your own results. We got the surgery factor. We all know that every hand is different. So if a formula is working for you, for example, if you're using SRKT, not your patient, and you're getting good results, you don't have a reason to change a formula, okay? So evaluate your own results is one of the best uh, advices I could tell. How does a clinician know when a measurement is likely to be correct or incorrect? So Dr. Hill said, a measurement is only as good as your ability to know what it means. So we could measure a lot of things in the eye, but if we don't know the exact meaning of this measurement, for example, anterior uh, surface of the cornea, that wouldn't make a difference on the calculation of the IOL. Right now, I'm sorry. Right now, the idea of a universal IOL power formula that works in every eye of all shapes and sizes, it's really an attractive one, but it is unlikely unrealistic, at least for now. So that's what I have uh, to share with you today. Thank you very much for having me again here. It is always a pleasure. Uh, and let's see some of your questions. What kind of formula best sort for actual length? Should medium actual length and long actual length? I think we've, we've talked about it several times. Uh, all the formulas perform well in normal eyes. The issue is big eyes or uh, small eyes. If you're using third generation formulas, Hoffer Q is the one that works the best for uh, small eyes. And uh, SRKT is the one that works the best for long eyes. If you're using one of the four generation formulas, well, Olsen or Barrett should be the best for any type of eyes, at least for right now. Why are you unable to calculate measurements with Isle Master Matur? Ah, okay. Depends on which Isle Master you use. Uh, Isle Master 3.4. 3.4 uh, doesn't perform, perform that well because the composite signal that it's using it doesn't have the power enough to get through opaque media, such as hard cataract. IOL Master 500, on the other hand, it got the composite signal and this composite signal will get us a lot of more eyes that we could measure because the signal has more power to get through this hard cataract. If we are talking about IOL Master 700, IOL Master 700 work with swept source OCT. Swept source OCT has a bigger wavelength. It's around 1050 nanometers. 1050 nanometers could get through opaque media, such as corneal opacities, such as uh, uh, hard cataracts. So uh, if you're looking for an IOL Master that will get you through all these cataracts, 
you will you will want to look for IL Master 700, but I want to say uh, your Master 700 is really expensive machine because strap service technology, it is expensive technology right now. If I only have ultrasound available, should I use manufactured constants uh, or are there? Yes, if you are using only ultrasound, you could work with the A constant provided by the, by the uh, by the manufacturer of the lens. But one thing, A constants provided by the manufacturer only works, I mean, not only works, let me rephrase this, are made for ultrasound biometry when you're using uh, the cup, when you're not using the direct contact. If you're using ultrasound with direct contact, you could have a lot of errors. If you're using immersion, then it will work quite well with this type of constant. Ask a mathematician. Yes, we should ask a mathematician. I don't have a mathematician friend. I do have a couple of physics friends. Maybe I should ask them. <laughs> are these new formulas categorized into the four generation itself? Yes, they are. They are categorized into four generation themselves. Now, what different does gender of the patient have for calculation by Kane formula? I exactly don't know. I should ask Dr. Kane maybe about this, but it doesn't seem so. When I, when I was looking for this, I, I tried to get why, why gender will make any, any type of difference. I actually don't know. I, 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 will, I will get an answer for you. Oh, I'm sorry, it's an anonymous attendee. I'll, I'll try to get an answer for that. Which formula best work with pediatrics? Well, it depends how old are the pediatric patients. If we're talking about, for example, a, a baby that has a congenital cataract, well, it's a really small eye. You shouldn't use SRKT for really small eyes because you won't get that good uh, measurements. Now, on pediatric, on pediatric patients, we should consider that when the eye starts developing and it starts growing, the lens that we first implant won't work after some, some years. So uh, maybe the Barrett formula will give you all the information you need because you need to exchange that lens afterwards. And the Barrett formula is the only one that got the RX formula where you could add a piggyback or add another, another or exchange the lens. So maybe, maybe that will work best for you. If you're talking about a pediatric patient that is around 13, 14 years old, the growth of the eye is almost uh, the same as an adult. So you could use dependent on the actual length and it's sort of other formulas, but uh, pediatric patients are really, really hard. Which single formula do you prefer in cases of keratoconus? Rx, well, for this patient, we, okay. So let me, let me try to answer this in two, two parts. For post-refractive, uh, post-keratorefractive surgery, post-penetrating keratoplasty, long myopic eyes, showy peropic eyes, I use the barrack form. That works perfect. If we're using keratoconus, it depends on which, uh, how, uh, how big is the conus. Uh, if it's a uh, grade one or grade two, we could work with Olsen or Barrett formula. If it's three or four, what, what we do actually is uh, perform uh, 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 post penetrating, uh, uh, penetrating keratoplasty on these patients and then, and then exchange the lens. But if we want to just change the lens without taking in account the keratoconus on the cornea, I would say to use another machine, not only a topographer, but a tomographer such as the Pentacam that will measure not only the anterior surface of, of the cornea, but it will measure also the posterior surface of the cornea. Okay, so. IOL calculation, post-penetrating keratoplasty and a stable keratoconus. I think we've, we've talked about this just on the previous question. What is the meaning of true K? True K means the true uh, corneal power. It takes in account not only the anterior surface of the eye, but the posterior surface of the eye. You will ask me, well, then does this biometer measure the posterior surface of the eye? And the answer is no. 
they do not measure the posterior surface of the eye, except the ones that are working with shine fluke technology that could measure the posterior surface of the eye, such as the Pentacam AXL and the Galilei G, uh, it's the G6 or G, G8, actually, I think. <laughs> okay, so uh, true K stands for that. How important is the posterior corneal surface measurement? <laughs> I think we I answered these questions already. So it is really important if, if we are talking about uh, patients that have been performed uh, refractive surgery or has keratoconus or, or any sort of this. If you're using four generation formulas such as Barrett or, or, or Olsen, Olsen with uh, inferior uh, by mathematical uh, regressions algorithms, the posterior surface of the cornea. I personally think that we should measure it directly. I, I've got a meeting with Dr. Olsen and asked about it. And he says that his formula performs pretty well without the need to measuring directly the posterior surface of the eye, of the cornea. I mean, I, uh, I don't want to say that I disagree with him, but I do think that it's better to measure that, that inferior mathematically. That's my opinion. What is the difference between keratometry, total keratometry, and total corneal power? Which one is the best parameter for IOL calculation? Well, again, it depends. If you got a normal cornea, just K1 and K2 will be fine. If you got an high aberrating cornea, I suggest to use a, a topographer or a tomographer to get the whole cornea instead of the just the central part of the cornea. Uh, keratometry is just anterior surface. It only may measures K1 and K2. That's the, the most curvature part of the eye and the less curvature part of the eye. Total keratometry, it's the whole corneal power of the whole anterior surface of the eye. And total corneal power will be the anterior surface of the cornea minus the posterior surface of the cornea. That's the total corneal power. So Melissa, what uh, then uh, would be your recommended IOL formula for children? I think we've answered that already. IL refers to central anterior corneal surface or central posterior surface. IL is actual length. Actual length is the whole measure of the eye. Actual length, depending on which machine you're using, could be measured from the anterior surface of the cornea to the anterior surface of the retina. Other machines measure from the posterior surface of the cornea to the anterior surface of the retina. So most of the machines, if, if they, they change the way they measure the cornea, if they include the cornea or not, will have like 500 microns difference between each other. Most of them measure from the anterior part of the cornea to the anterior part of the retina. What about cane formula? Uh, what about cane formula? We talk about cane formula. It's a great formula. It uses artificial intelligence. It performs quite well. I don't really have that much experience with cane formula. It seems that performs outstanding. But uh, as, as we talk about, uh, in my practice, we are using most the Barrett and the Olsen formula. And uh, as I told you on the last uh, slide of the presentation, if that's working for you, there's no need to be changed. I would like to see how performs the cane formula pot. So maybe we could give it a try. Thank you, Marco. Melissa, how do you decide when you need to use Olsen rather than the Barrett calculations? I only use Olsen instead of Barrett when I got really corneas that are, are um, that has a high high aberration. Most of the time, I told you, 98% of our patients are measured with the Barrett calculation instead of Olsen. In my opinion, in, in my experience, both of them will work quite well. So instead, if, if, if you need to exchange a lens, you should go for Barrett because it's got all that information. If you don't need to exchange a lens or it's a virgin eye, you could go with Olsen without any hesitation. Both performs outstanding, that I could tell. What was the indication for using Olsen over 2% on Barrett? Well, as I told you, it depends on the cornea and, and how, how these patients, uh, if they got any type of, of other surgeries. So I think we've answered that too. Should I, should I personalize my constant or it's okay to use the constant from web, websites? You could 
personalize your constant that will be uh, that will make a more custom made surgery for you if you got the time and the interest there is a sheet on the uh, ULIP website that uh, you could fill out with your patient, with your results, and they could provide you a personalized constant with your own surgeon factor, if that works really good for you. Uh, you need, I don't want to say a lot, but you need some amount of, of post-op data from patients if you want to personalize your constant for yourself. What is the definition of target refractive? What reasons why don't we choose zero? That's a really interesting question. I personally set the target refraction for 0.5 diopters. And that is because I do prefer if something goes wrong that my patient be a little myop instead of a little hyperop. Because uh, when you, after the surgery, became hypero and you never been a hypero before, then you got a really unhappy patient. Besides that, when I target my, my refraction to 0.5 and the patient, and, and I, I'm placing a, a, a spheric or monofocal IOL, uh, the patient could use that small myopic shift that I gave them for uh, reading a little bit, at least the watch or the cell phone. So that's why I target for 0.5. Some of the some of the doctors target for zero. That's okay if your surgeon factor it's it's okay. I mean, do what it's working for you. Don't try to change it. I mean, if it's not working for you, change it. But if it's working for you, go ahead. In my hand, 0.5 is the, the target I always choose. For about rhetoric, K, from which investigation should we use? I don't understand the question. From which investigation? You, you need, for bad rhetoric, you need the, the parameters provided by your topographer. If it comes with a, with a, the biometer comes with a topographer itself, you should use that. I suggest for any toric implantation, not only for Barrett, but any toric implantation that you don't use a keratometer. You do not measure just the six points in the center of the cornea. Try to measure a bit more, try to use a topographer, try to, to give more information of the cornea. For toric, uh, remember that toric IOLs only tolerate a disintegration of five degrees the much. So, the best information about astigmatism you could get from that patient will be the best. How do you advise a cataract surgeon who operates in a resource efficient environment and aims at achieving patients with fair refractive outcomes and has no tool for this measurement, but can only do refraction? Is there a hope for the surgeon? <laughs> I wanna say yes, Chica. I wanna say yes, there is a hope for those surgeons. But uh, if you're operating on that start, start in, in such conditions, most of the time, patients comes with no vision or with really, really diminished vision. I said uh, 2,400 or worse. So on those patients, if you give them the ability to at least, at least have uh, some sort of vision or to improve their vision, they will be so, so happy. We're having issues when, with patients on big cities I mean, if, if you want to operate a, a, a CEO of a big company, that man wants to be zero. He wants to be emetropic. He wants to have multifocal IOL. He wants to perform as, as he was a 20 year old. When you are doing surgeries on the other sort of patients, if you, if you do a great surgery and they are, uh, got uh, some vision, they will be happy. Uh, it's an advice to never leave a patient uh, aphakic. Try to place an IOL on every circumstance unless it couldn't be done. So thank you for the information. You're welcome. Do you have any concept about Panacea IOL calculator? I'm not 
so I don't have any concept about that. Sorry, I've heard about it, but uh, I haven't used it. Thank you for your lecture. You're welcome. You say you use the bar at 98 and 2% uh, will be more dependent on also than the former. Uh, we've already talked about it. Thank you. Thank you. What is the lowest as an air value accepted for a mature cataract? I don't have the right answer right now, Diana. Uh, SNR value is a signals noise ratio. So it depends how much noise you got on the background and how, how hard or how deep is your signal. So if you get a, a good signal and you don't have that amount of noise on the, on the back end, you could get a, a good calculation. But at exact SNR value, mm, I, I couldn't answer that right now. I think it depends actually which which biometer you're using. Can we still use Barrett formula even without optical biometer and use other biometric like ultrasound? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You could use Barrett formula with the if you're doing a uh, ultrasound biometry, but remember which uh, Barrett formula you are aiming for. If you are talking about universal two and this, it's a burden eye, there won't be an issue. If we're talking about the other type of eyes, long eyes, post-op surgeries or anything, I think that you should consider using a topographer, a biometer or a machine uh, like the Aladdin, for example, that got topographer, pupillometer and also the uh, biometer all in one. I enjoy synopsis. I will go for Barrett suit as well, but because of resource limitation, I'm stuck with SRK for now. Okay, Boniface. If that's working for you, I think that you should just stick it, stick to it. But remember, SRKTs do not perform well on small eyes. Please don't use that formula for eyes less than 23 millimeters. Use Hoffer Q instead. You will get better results with that. But uh, for medium eyes and long eyes, SRKT is the third generation formula that performs the best. What difference does the gender of patient? I don't know. I, I, I would talk about that. I'm sorry. I, I'll ask Dr. Keen next time I'll, I'll be able. How about the Haggis L formula for pulse LASIK? That's, that's a great question. A Haggis L is one of the formulas that works the best for pulse LASIK. It's accurate. Uh, it works with IL Master 500. It's really, really accurate formula. It doesn't take into account some, some factors. But remember, all of Dr. Dr. Haggis formulas, instead of having just one A constant, they work with three A constant, A0, A1, and A2. So that will take into account a little bit of the effective lens position, not as well as the other formulas because you got more data. But uh, Haggis L was the formula that we were using for uh, prior uh, Olsen or Barrett. So it's a really great formula for myopic eyes. Which formula do you use in keratoconus? We answer to that depends on the degree of the keratoconus, depends on, on, on if it's stable or not, depends on several factors. But again, you should measure if you've got keratoconus, anterior surface of the cornea, and posterior surface of the cornea as well. I will, I will uh, recommend the, the holiday report from the Pentacom for, for this type of, of, of patients if, if it's available on your, on your region, Alexander. What about panacea? I haven't got any experience with panacea. Sorry about that. Why are some formulas called third and other four generations? Because third generation formulas were prior formulas that doesn't take in account effective lens position. Remember the four generation formulas do take in account effective lens position and they measure it. You measure the central corneal power. You, I mean, the central corneal thickness, you measure the ACD and you measure lens thickness. If you don't measure this, you won't be using a four generation formula. You will be using third generation formulas. Thank you for your lecture. Thank you for attending. Great presentation. What is RX? Does ACD refer to anterior cornea? ACD refers to anterior chamber depth. It's the amplitude of the anterior chamber. It will be measured from the posterior part of the cornea to the anterior surface of the lens. And uh, what is RX? Rx stands for refractive surprises. So that's a part of the Barrett suit that you will use when you need to exchange a lens or to put a piggyback, piggyback lens. 
<laughs> do the two IOLs will nearly with uh, do two IOLs with nearly same lens factor? We always have same IOL power for an eye, so it's advisable to put IOL same power to nearly same lens factor without taking in from the biometer. I do not recommend that. Uh, every eye, even if it's on the same patient, performs differently. Uh, Again, effective lens position is one uh, one of the measurements that you should take in account for this. So I do recommend always measure. Can you talk about panacea? I'm sorry, Every, there's a lot of questions about panacea. I never work with it. I'm so sorry. How about calculate keratoconus using total corneal power? Yes, that's the way you should use total corneal power. If you've got a machine that will measure the anterior surface of the of the cornea and the posterior surface of the cornea, that will be the correct approach. Remember, for example, the Pentacan has this holiday report that will allow you to select which type of IOL it's better for this sort of patients. Marco, how about calculate keratoconus using total corneal power? I think that's the one we've just answered. Thank you, thank you. What about operating the region and IOL operative the region? Oh, okay, okay. So you refer after post-op the region. Yeah, it, it will it will change the anterior surface of the cornea as, as well as the refractive surgery. So again, you need to look at the topography. You need to look uh, the whole cornea uh, topography, not just the center part of it, it depends how big was the region prior to the surgery. If it's only grade one, small one, maybe it doesn't affect that much. But remember, after you operated the region from a patient, you do not give them prescriptions after uh, the surgery. You wait for time to 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 it uh, heal out, and then you do uh, that. So it's kind of the same for IOL calculations. Ultrasonic best machine is this time. Well, okay, I don't agree or disagree with that. Have you used EDOF lenses? Do you have an opinion of them? Yes, Yeni, I use EDOF lenses. EDOF stands for Enhanced uh, Deep of Focus. Uh, they do work quite well, but I should say that you should select your patients quite well if you want to use a premium IOL. Premium IOL should be EDOF, uh, trifocals, uh, multifocals, or that any sort of IOL. I won't place that lens without doing the, the best measurements of the eye possible. And I will talk with the patient because uh, our eyes are not used for that. We do our eyes do accommodation, and these are not accommodative IOLs. So it they doesn't work the way our eyes are used to. So uh, not all patients benefit from multifocal IOLs. Not all patients benefit from EDOF IOLs. You should talk with your patient. You should, you should ask your patient uh, uh, what labor does he make or does she make I mean, if it's a airplane pilot, I don't place an EDOF <laughs> IOL on those guys. If it's a, a CEO of a company, maybe yes, because he wants to look at the computer and look at his cell phone, everything uh, all together. So my suggestion, select pretty well your patients. Some biometer taking a consideration of posterior corneal power, yes. The Pentacam AXL, and the Galilei G8, they take in account the posterior corneal power because they do measure it. Uh, most of the topographers using plasticdo discs just measure the anterior surface of the cornea. If we consider some K values with posterior corneal power, uh, it will be integrated. Yes, that's true, uh, true net power or total corneal power. K1, K2 refer to step and flat cornea. Yes. K1 and K2 is the steepest meridian and the flattest meridian of the cornea. Is immersion A scan still the gold standard? Oh, it is the standard used for IOL manufacturers to provide the A constant. But I do think that right now, most of the clinics and the calculations are made by optical biometers. So I want to say no, 
but I think it's yes. <laughs> Can we use simply values for, from the power of her to take near perfect? I will power pulse refractive surgery in calculation. Yeah, sim K. No, I won't use sim K. I will prefer to use uh, immune meridians. And on um, these patients, I will also use a pupillometer to look how big does the pupil uh, contracts or, or moves. Uh, because that that will change the, the effective uh, the effective power of the of the IOL. So instead of seeing K values, I prefer ME meridians. Or if you got the opportunity to measure anterior and posterior, you should do that. Does any formula use vitreous length? Vitreous length does it need to be a count? I don't know vitreous length. No, I don't think so. I don't think the vitreous will be a factor to consider. We do change on biometry when we have uh, a vitreous or a silicon oil in the eye, and that's because of the of the refraction index that that should be changed. But uh, about the vitreous itself, I don't think so. What about SRKT? Oops, where is it? Ah, SRKT. Jose Antonio Fuentes. Oh, I'll say this in Spanish. Gracias, Tocayo. Un gusto que estés por acá. What about SRKT formulas for the best IOL calculations? SRKT, as we talk a lot, they work pretty well on big eyes. Are the third generation formulas that works the best on big eyes. Uh, they do, it doesn't perform good on small eyes. So I will use a SRKT formula just for normal or big eyes, never for small eyes. Thank you very much, thank you. Do you have any experience with IOL station from NIDEC, what do you think? No, I haven't got any experience with a IOL station from NIDEC, but I've heard that it performs pretty well. Uh, that's that's the only thing I could I could say for that. Uh, I work with NIDEC machines, they, they do perform well. Uh, I, I, I love the OPD scan. It, it is one of the best machines that NIDEC got, uh, but I, I haven't been working with the, this IOL station. I heard the good, good things about it. Thank you, thank you, Jenny. I miss your answer about ACD due to network. Would you like to ACD stands for anterior chamber depth? Anterior chamber depth is the amplitude of the anterior chamber and it's measured from the posterior part of the cornea to the anterior surface of the lens. Great lecture, thank you, thank you, thank you. Does your center do training of cataract surgeons? Yes, I would like to see your name, but it says anonymous. We do have a, a, a residence program in our clinic. My, uh, my clinic name is of, Ophthalmo Salud. Ophthalmo Salud is uh, the biggest eye clinic in in, in uh, we do have a training program, and we also got a fellow program for anterior uh, segment uh, surgeons for uh, cornea refractive surgery, for retina, and also for imaging diagnostic. That is the thing that I do the most. Which formulas will be your first choice to calculate IOL power in an eye with silicon? Uh -huh. Any formula would work win an eye with silicon, but you do need to change the refractive index on your biometer or in your uh, ultrasound machine because the refractive index of silicon oil is quite different from the one on, on vitreous. Is there any means by which IOL power can be elicited in the operator eye? I don't quite understand. IOL power can be elicited ah, after you implant the IOL well. There is a mathematician way to, to, to get the power, but the best thing is to look at the chart and look which, which lens has been implanted. ¿Qué prefieres? Opedinídeco pentacam para mediciones. Pues yo prefiero el pentacam para mediciones. A no ser, I'm sorry to answer this in Spanish, a no ser que, que, que se quiera medir lo que es aberraciones, El OPD funciona un poco mejor para aberraciones, pero si voy a medir directamente curvaturas o poder de la córnea, eh, prefiero el pentaco. Can I apply new generation formulas program on all biometry instrument of, or not? Oh, well, I don't. I don't think so. It depends on which which biometer you're working with, but I don't think you could 
add a new formula to an old instrument. Maybe you should ask the the vendor that you of your biometer. I do know that if you're using some ultrasound machines, you could do that. But in optical biometers, I really don't think so. Wonderful lecture. Oh, thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Quisiera estudiar. Listo. Tienes mi correo electrónico. Se los voy a poner al final de la charla de nuevo para que lo puedan ver y se puedan comunicar conmigo los que los que quieran algo de esto. Can you share your email, sir? Sure. I will share my email. Why are some my old masters can't? I will calculate of major cataracts. We respond that we already answered that. It's due to signal. I will master 3.4 doesn't perform well on a heart cataracts. I will master 500 performs better because of the composite signal. Actually, our heart cataracts, the nucleus is not the factor that will affect the most. This, uh, um, when you have this cataracts that will have a lot of cortex issue, cortex will start doing a diffraction of the signal and that's why you won't get a good signal. So uh, that's why it doesn't matter. It doesn't measure quite well. That's informative, thank you. Muchas gracias, thank you. Thank you too. Para calcular con Olsen o con Barrett, tomas el poder total corneal o solo la cara anterior. Uh, Enrique, para calcular con Olsen o con Barrett, tomo solamente la cara anterior, a no ser que sea un paciente que tenga muchas aberraciones, en cuyo caso prefiero usar el Holiday Report del Pentacam para introducir los valores en la fórmula de Barrett y luego poder calcular. Recuerda que la fórmula de Barrett o la fórmula de Olsen no miden directamente la cara posterior del corte. I miss your answer about IOL calculation operate I due to network. Oh, what was the question? I'm sorry, IOL calculation in operated eye. I have to go back. Uh, as an error varies in different optical biometers. Yes, it varies in different different optical biometers and it varies also on the same biometer because it's a, a, it's a mathematical function between signal and noise radio. So if you got a good signal, and a low uh, noise radio, you will have a big number. If you got a lot of noise and a less strong signal, you won't have that variable. So that's why it changed. For a FACI guys, will you prefer anterior ICL or iris flow fixated lens? We use uh, Artisan for a fakia, So uh, we do prefer iris flow instead of uh, eye anterior chamber uh, Interior chambers uh, lenses, they got their optics on on the on the on the angle actually, and the, when you got the optic on the angle and it moves, it start uh, sending some pigment into the trabecular mesh,ure and you could get some some issues after that. So that's why we prefer uh, iris claw IOLs. Thank you very much for your assistance. Here, thank you very much for CyberSight for having me again, and uh, I hope to all you have a wonderful day.